Hey guys, uh, so this is our third lesson on networking and we're going to learn a little bit about topologies and wireless and encryption. Uh, encryption is one of my favorite topics because I always a I'm always able to talk about one of my heroes, Alan Turing, and about the Enigma code, so it's a really good thing. Um, but we're going to talk about topologies, wireless and encryption. So what I want you to get out of this lesson is I want you to actually know what a network infrastructure is and I want you to be able to talk a little bit about encryption and just to understand the basics of how it works. Now, what we're going to look at today is we're going to look at the topologies to begin with. So what is a network topology? Well, you may have come up with some ideas and may have some you may have drawn some pictures before, but basically what a network topology is, is the infrastructure of your network. It is a model of what your physical network looks like. Think, of, think about how the tube map is an abstraction of London and how you get around. It's a similar way with our network. So there are four topologies you will need to be aware of for your exam. If you are doing the old spec, the computing, you won't necessarily need to know a much about mesh, which I've got on here, but it's good to know about it anyway, because it's something extra that you can pull out of your bag. So you've got the bus, ring, star and mesh. Now, the video that's going to come up next will give you a bit of an indication of those three, uh, but then I will fill in the gaps and talk a little bit about the mesh network. So watch this video uh, that comes up next and it should give you some indication of what the topologies are and things that you need to be aware of. So at this point in the lesson, if you're a teacher, the, what you might want to do is get your students to, to come up and actually get them to hook their arms together. This is what I would usually do in the lesson and it's probably how they'll remember it. I get them to hook their arms together and pretend that they are the backbone and then I get other students to put their hands on each other's shoulders as if they are the clients of the other computers that are connected to it. And then I kind of get students that are in the middle of the backbone to drop out and, I, and then I say, well, what would happen to the network? What would happen to the computer on that side or that side? I get them to try and pass notes up and down so they can see that the other computer can't get the message through. So there are some questions that you can ask there. But with a bus topology, they might be easy to install and it might not require a lot of cable, but it does have problems. If this backbone breaks, 
your network will fail and the problem with that is you just you can't access any of the information or data now the pro other problem we've got is the more computers that you add the more workstations that you add the slower it will become because of data collisions now that's a key word a bunch of key words there that you need to be aware of for the exam the other thing that you need to be aware of is that every workstation on the network sees the data and that's a big security risk the other type of topology we have is the star network. Now you can have one student in the middle of the room and you can have other students putting their hands on their shoulders to act as if they are the other clients. Now you could get this student in the middle to fail and kind of pretend to kind of crumble down onto the ground and then you can see that the other students will, won't be able to send messages to each other because the hub in the middle has failed. So you can demonstrate some things you can also demonstrate and ask the students to put a second hand on the other student's shoulders because what you can do is demonstrate that that's more cabling. So each arm is a cable. So you can demonstrate that the star network has a lot of expensive cable. So it is reliable because it's a lot quicker and you, you don't really have as much room for error. Now, it's a high performing network because the device in the middle, the switch, can actually route the traffic to where it needs to go. So there's not lots of data collisions as there would be on a hub or on a bus topology. They are very reliable and if one cable or device fails, you can see, if I just scribble through this here, all right, that the rest of it is still available to our students. Now it is expensive because you do need more cabling and extra hardware is needed for the switches in the middle and that can cost a lot of money. The other problem is if the hub in the middle fails your whole network goes down. So these are things you need to bear in mind for the star network. The next one is quite simple to demonstrate. You can get all your students hooking their arms together in a ring. The good thing about this network is it's quite easy to demonstrate because you can pass a piece of paper around the ring in one direction and demonstrate that the data goes quickly. Problem is, if you need to take a student out of the network to upgrade their hardware, so you could talk about how if this was a computer, you need to upgrade their hardware or software, the network goes down, you've got some network downtime. And that is demonstrated by this next slide. You can see here that the advantage of this network is that it's really quick to send the information around and there's no data collisions. But again, if one computer fails, the whole network fails because it can't go round in the circle. Imagine this was a break. That information was going round in a circle and now it can't finish off its cycle. So things to bear in mind. The other type of network we have, and if you think about the peer-to-peer -peer network we talked about previously, is a mesh network. The problem with this is that you have lots and lots of cabling and it can be expensive. There are some benefits with the mesh network though, because if one computer went down, the traffic can be rerouted from one of the other cables. And you can set up a partial mesh. So if you look at the diagram on the right here, some computers are connected together, whereas others aren't. Problem is, if one of those connections fails, such as this one, it's off the network. It can't reroute. So you need to bear that in mind with the network you're setting up. So what I recommend is draw some of these topologies out using draw.io, explain the advantages and the disadvantages, make some sort of revision guide that is going to help you, or replay this video. Now, the other thing that you need to be aware of is Wi-Fi. Now, there are a lot of slides in this presentation. There's a lot to cover, and I would split this over two lessons. But Wi-Fi uses frequencies of 2.5 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz wave bands. Now, that is the wave length. So the wave band can be split into separate channels so that lots of different Wi-Fi devices can be on your network. So there are legal constraints to how many channels are used so that you don't end up having channels overlapping and interfering with each other. Because if you've got lots of devices with the same wave band, 
you're going to end up with interference. Think about it is if you are listening to a radio and use one of those dongles on your phone to tune into another radio station, think about the interference that you may have had in the past. Now, Wi-Fi is common and we use it so that we can get our devices to connect. But the problem is you can only connect to it up to only 20 meters. So a single Wi-Fi access point can share the bandwidth. I mentioned this in the previous presentation. And again, there are some security issues because other devices can pick up your signal. I mentioned in the previous slides that you need to hide your security identification. Now, this is my favorite thing to talk about. What I usually do at this point in my lessons is I get the students to actually write a message and encrypt it and write, make a key for it so that they can understand what encryption is. Now, it, it's usually you have your message. Think about what happened in the war when Germany had the Enigma code. They would send a message that was encrypted out to everybody. And it was Alan Turing and his team of people that had to translate that code. This is what you're going to get your students to do as a starter activity. So encryption is used to stop people from getting your information. So things like WhatsApp and other applications have encryption on them so that other people aren't able to read your messages. It doesn't stop people print screening that, but it's just something to bear in mind. So it's so that other people can send secret messages. Now, I, at this point, will have got the students to decrypt each other's messages using something like this, which shows hieroglyphics, and I would have got them to make this message. Now, keywords that they need to be aware of, they need to know that plain text is the original message, cipher text is the encrypted message, Encryption is if you convert the original plain message into cipher and the encryption algorithm is the way we work it out. Now at this point what I might do in my lesson is show you an encrypted message that one of the students have done and said well that's your cipher text. Then I would have asked them to encrypt it, okay, to convert it so you can demonstrate that to your students. Brute force. Now, students need to know about security issues on networks, and brute force is a way that people will try and access your account. And this is why our passwords need to be secure. So use letters, capital letters, lowercase letters, and you shouldn't use words that are your favorite football team or your favorite pop group, because brute force attacks will try the most common passwords out there. In fact, did you know that the most common password used today is still password? So brute force is a way that people will try and access your personal information with a password. Somebody will make this program, they will include a dictionary of common words and all they do is push a button until they get your password. So this is why you need to make it complicated for people and you need to be aware of what brute force is in your exam. So the Caesar shift was commonly used to encrypt messages and it was used up until recently actually, uh, maybe a hundred years. And the idea is that if you had the letter A, B, C, you would, or A, B, C, D, you would shift the letters by maybe two or three letters until the message didn't make sense anymore. I'm going to show you a diagram of that on the next couple of slides. But the problem was as soon as you analyze the frequency of letters, you are able to crack the message quite easily. So you can see the Caesar shift here. So this is a shift of B, so that was one, two, three. So that was a, C, that was a shift of three letters in this case. So the letter B would become E. So if I had, uh, if I was writing the word bad, what the person receiving the message would receive, so B would be E, A would be D, and D would be G. Now, 
That on its own would look like somebody spelled edge wrong. So this is why people used encryption methods like this to confuse people. Now the problem with this was, so the problem with frequency analysis is that you can reveal the code just by knowing where the letter I or A is in a message. If I had a message saying, here is the dog, that would be quite difficult to actually work out. But if I said, I like to eat pie, the letter I is easy to actually work out on the Caesar shift. Now, moving forward, why don't you try and create your own encryption message? Why don't you try and encrypt something and come up with a message using ciphertext, using plain text, actually come up with the encryption algorithm and get people cracking your code? There is one other method of encryption that the people doing the new spec will need to know about. The Caesar shift was too easy to crack. So what became the norm and that what people started to do is actually start to use two keys to crack the message. So there would be a private key and a public key. This is called asymmetric key encryption. So you need to be aware of this. Basically, the two keys complement each other to unlock the message. One key is to decrypt and one key is to encrypt. I guess the best way to describe this is one key is public that anybody can see and that's used to encrypt the message. The other key is secret. So I will have my public key and I get it from, from a directory and I will send Dan my message that says, hi, I'm going to school today. And at the end of it, I might include my public key. Now, what Dan can do is use his key to complement that, and that will reveal the message to him. So that's called asymmetric encryption, all right? So one has the public key and the other has the private key. I hope this video has been useful to you. If you have found it useful, please subscribe to the channel and look at the other videos. Thank you for watching and good night.